Okay everyone, Professor Steve here. And now that we've uh, begun to sort of draw more complete pictures starting with the, the case of carbon, um, the next few lessons and the rest of this unit will be sort of about how the interconnectivity of it all. So if you take the biogeochemical cycle of one element, um, it's almost always intertwined with, with many elements and sometimes, you know, all elements of importance. Um, even if it's not directly. In other words, the carbon cycle, um, you know, if it's in organic matter, it's attached to certain types of elements. If it's in organ inorganic matter, it's it's attached to other other types of elements. So so say in the organic matter pool, if you have nitrogen affecting the, the carbon in that, it, 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 that's locked up in that matter, it affects that cycle, which indirectly affects the, the which means that nitro nitrogen indirectly affects how carbon moves into the inorganic um, pool, so on and so forth. And and so we'll use a couple more, we'll do a couple more examples, and we'll still sort of use carbon as the linking source. But um, but we started to lean towards climate, and so we'll sort of stick with that theme and see just what other elements are interconnected and 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 sort of how we study that and why. And so we'll remember that it's the transformations and the interconnectivity, <clears throat> how it's mediated by biological, physical, and chemical parameters. And we left off with going over the the, the carbon dioxide record. And so um, scientists drill down into ice cores, um, and ice is layered over and over again over geologically long time periods. And as the ice forms, there are air and 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 liquid bubbles liquid and air bubbles and so if you can drill down and 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 then go into these air and liquid bubbles you can measure what was in the air and what was in the and what was in the environment um, at that time and then if you can put a date on that then you have a, an estimate for history and so that's what we do we go in and we we trap gases from these air bubbles deep down in ice cores and we can go back you know almost 500,000 years and get a good record of what the CO2 was and we use other proxies to to do other things and and we'll we'll just we're only going to touch on some of that today but we left off by saying that carbon dioxide over the last four, almost 500,000 years has had, have had these natural fluctuations and there's a lot of little fluctuations in between here but the overall trend is um, somewhere between 290 parts per million carbon dioxide and around 180 parts per million carbon dioxide and so it's fluctuated up and down and up and down and up and down um, for at least 500,000 years and we think for much much longer and that these ups and downs so when carbon dioxide is high um, it's a greenhouse gas, which we'll get into in a minute, and that means um, it warms the planet. And when it's very, very low, it's not warming the planet as much, and we have an ice age. So in order to really connect these things, we need to talk about links and feedbacks in biogeochemistry. And when we say feedback, um, or a feedback loop, what we mean is something that occurs in a cycle um, affects that cycle either negatively or positively. So um, you know, you can, we can use a bank account. You can use um, your body temperature when it's sick, as an example. Um, but um, so, a positive feedback um, is something that enhances or reinforces the outcome in that cycle. So, if your account balance grows, your account is larger, and so it earns more interest, and so your account balance grows even more, and that's a positive feedback loop. It goes around and around and around. Um, so that enhances it. And the negative one does the opposite. So it's important to point out that positive doesn't always mean a good thing, and negative doesn't always mean a bad thing. Positive just means it increases the cycle. Okay, it positively reinforces the cycle. And negative one means it opposes or decreases. It neg negates the outcome. So if your body temperature is very high because you're sick, your body sweats, um, or let's say just because you were working out or something, your body sweats, and because your body sweats, it cools off your body. Your body temperature drops. And so that doesn't feed back into your high body temperature, so that's a negative feedback. All right, so let's talk about this in terms of the carbon cycle and climate. So you should all at least be familiar, uh, slightly familiar, relatively familiar with the greenhouse effect, which is the trapping of energy um, in one form, or 
uh, letting energy in in one form essentially and trapping it as another form of energy and causing a warming effect okay so this happens on green in greenhouses it happens whenever light passes glass or plastic and so that's why we call it the greenhouse effect the greenhouse effect for the earth instead of glass or plastic we're talking about the atmosphere all the molecules in the atmosphere so the sun light comes in it hits the earth it actually hits the atmosphere first some of it bounces off the atmosphere especially if it's very cloudy that's called albedo the reflection so if it reflects off it never heats the atmosphere some of it actually hits the earth and and bounces off of there as well and all these just radiate back out into space and and don't have very much to do with the warming of the earth but mo a lot of that sunlight most of it hit, <coughs> hits the earth so it hits it as light energy, warms the Earth, and then radiates off as um, radiates off as infrared energy. So heat energy. It warms the Earth, radiates off as heat. Some of that heat blasts right back out into space, radiates right back out into space in a sort of wasted heat. Um, but a lot of it is trapped, and what traps it are certain molecules that are considered to be greenhouse gases. So the Earth is um, the, Earth, the, the, the atmosphere is made up mostly of nitrogen and oxygen, about 99% of it total, right? 70 some odd percent nitrogen, 20 some odd percent oxygen, and the rest are all small, minor, minor amounts. But the majority of it, nitrogen and oxygen, is invisible to infrared energy, so it lets it pass out, back out through the atmosphere. But there are some gases in the atmosphere, even though they're, they're, they make up a relatively small amount of it, that trap it. They trap it, they heat up, and they radiate the, that infrared energy in all directions, and that's what heats up our Earth. This is necessary for life on Earth. Without this effect, without the greenhouse effect, Earth would not maintain a climate within, uh, on which we, we could uh, live, that we could habitate. So what are the major greenhouse gases? Well, most people jump to CO2 first, but really the largest, or I should say the not the lar not having the largest effect, but the one of highest amount is water. There's tons of water in our atmosphere, um, and 60% of the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere is made up of water. Um, the next biggest, though, of course, is CO2, and so 30 about 35% of our gases of our greenhouse gases in our atmosphere is is CO2. The difference being CO2 is a much stronger greenhouse gas, so this effect of trapping it and radiating it out in all directions and doing this trapping and heating um, is not equal among all greenhouse gases. So water, um, there's much more water in the atmosphere than CO2, but water does a poorer job of trapping that, that infrared heat, and CO2 does a very good job, it's stronger. There are um, trace amounts of methane and nitrous oxide, which are make up pretty much the remainder of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but these are trace and so have a minimal effect. But the difference is these guys are about 21 and 310 times the greenhouse potential, that's what GHP stands for, as CO2. So these guys are much, much higher. So if we ever increased these guys um, to the same amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, the, the Earth would heat up to a point that we could not live on it anymore. <coughs> So if we trace the CO2 levels in the ocean through our ice core records um, over time, they bounce back and forth between these two similar levels for most of the past 500,000 years. And then we can use other chemical proxies and measurements in those ice cores and, and other things in the ocean and on, in the terrestrial environment to get a good feel for what the temperature was. And so we know that this has been occurring because we see that the temperature was, was warmer so more habitable, more livable for us, when CO2 was high. When CO2 was low, the temperature was on average, at its lowest points, the temperature was on average five, you know, five or six, sometimes even eight degrees colder, and that's global average, not like right where you're standing now. Some, some places were much colder than this, some places were much warmer than this, so if you average it out, five to five six seven degrees colder and that's all it takes for the earth to have an ice age so during times in history and we had high co2 we had um, warm livable climate low co2 ice age right 
livable ice age, livable ice age, livable ice age. And now we are right here where we're sort of, we're, we should be at sort of the top of one of these CO2 swings, but our CO2 level is way, way, way higher than natural, in, than, than historically is natural, and that's because we're putting a lot more CO2 into the ocean. But we haven't yet begun to feel that yet. See, our temperature is still here in the beginning of this, this warming trend. That's, that's actually a natural warming trend. And that's one of the arguments that scientists and politicians have about whether whether global warming is really happening. Yes, it's happening, um, but it's a natural thing. Global warming <clears throat> makes our planet naturally habitable, um, and we're pretty sure that our excess CO2 is going to warm it beyond the point um, that is natural, but we, we haven't really realized those effects yet. So what are some negative feedbacks to CO2? Or what are what are the, some of the feedbacks? What could we do to sort of suck up some of this excess CO2? And the answer is a big fat one that we've been talking about for almost this whole course in one way or another, and that's photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a way of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, right? And we can do this in terrestrial plants, or we can do this in phytoplankton in the ocean. And we've talked about the differences in turnover, biomass turnover. I mean, the good thing about terrestrial plants is they're not CO2 limited, which means, um, or they are CO2 limited because the CO2 has to diffuse towards them, and that's a good thing. That means they'll keep sucking it up as long as it's out there. Problem is, trees don't die and turn over and turn over their biomass very often, so they're not going to need a lot more CO2. Um, but we did talk about the fact that um, phytoplankton do turn over very rapidly and they move a lot of carbon around so that's a very good thing the problem is the ocean's not co2 limited there's tons of co2 there's plenty for the phytoplankton there so something has to happen in order to draw that co2 down into the ocean the other thing is that places where phytoplankton are super active are generally nutrient limited and so nu nutrient limitation means that there could be plenty of co2 to suck down out of the atmosphere but if there's not enough nutrients for the phytoplankton to grow then that's not a good thing and so that's why we start to look at other things that are connected to this carbon cycle so the last thing I'm going to talk about for this part of this lecture um, is is differences between types of primary production. So here we see sort of the processes we've talked about over and over again, but now we're going to sort of separate them into two different types. So we know that we can have CO2 and all the nutrients necessary in the surface ocean for phytoplankton to grow. They go into phytoplankton biomass. We know that that phytoplankton biomass can be consumed by a heterotroph. We know that the heterotrophs can respire and they can also die and decompose and become nutrients again and feed back into this nutrient and CO2 pool, pool which can then be taken up by the phytoplankton again. This recycling, this regeneration of nutrients, is called regenerated primary production. Now this is just one example <coughs> here of how these nutrients and, or, and organic matter can, can be removed from this cycle, right? This sinking process that we talked about can be removed other ways too, but the majority of it is these, these processes happen by some other processes, aggregation, defecation, um, and sinking, they can be removed from this local ecosystem, right? They drop to the, um, they sink to the deep ocean, and if they don't make it all the way to the sea floor, they become bacterial biomass, right? This organic matter pool sinks, it is decomposed, becomes bacterial biomass, represented by these little black and white bubbles here, these little cells. These the bacteria regenerate the nutrients, right? We talked about how in the deep ocean nutrients are high, the surface ocean nutrients are low because they're always being used up. That's because the prokaryotes are regenerating them. Now in the deep ocean we have circulation, we know that, so those nutrients and all these processes right here continually can move and then we also know that there are circumstances where this stuff can be upwelled, right? Mixed back into the surface ocean. So picture this as a totally different food web similar food web but in a totally different location and these nutrients have been washed up here okay so when these nutrients are washed up and this ecosystem uses those nutrients to do the same thing that's going on over here right nutrients taken up by primary productivity consumed and recycled we call that new primary production because the nutrients that are feeding it come from someplace else okay so that's new primary productivity now, what's the difference? The difference is this carbon is continually recycled. Whereas when you introduce excess nutrients from somewhere else, 
um, you become carbon limited because there's plenty of nutrients coming into this food web and CO2 now can be drawn down because you're carbon limited the CO2 is drawn down to very low levels and allows for carbon to be drawn into the ocean here when the carbon's drawn into the ocean we suck CO2 out of the atmosphere to fuel these cycles that we've talked about so that's the significance of new primary production and we'll take this one next step further